In this example, we're going to take a look at a slightly more complex buffer overflow. As I explained in my last video, which covered an even more simple example, more modern exploitation requires all kinds of concepts like return-oriented programming that aren't really the objective of this video. Generally, it's best to learn to walk before you decide to jump off a building and fly like Superman. Equally, this walkthrough could lead to an explosion of explanations such as what the hell a procedure linkage table is, how a procedure call stack works, or more detailed stack mechanics and computing fundamentals. But we'll keep more focused on the overflow and the core principle of hijacking execution. As before, we're going to be taking advantage of the fact that some functions enable us to overflow an area of memory designated for data and write into other important structures that change the way the computer operates. An important concept in computing is something called the procedure call stack. It's a special structure in memory that the computer uses to store information, kind of like a handy notebook on your desk. In this particular case, it's heavily related to the entry and exit of functions and passing around of information like parameters. Let's take a look at some new code here in overflow.c. It's very, very similar to before. We've got our char array password size of 16, and we're using the same vulnerable function gets, which doesn't do any bounds checking. This time, however, there isn't a neat little integer for us to overwrite. Instead, we've got a more strict check that does a stracomp against password, defined up here, to password1. And that's a little nod to the bad passwords that people typically use. If this check fails, then we print out you fail. Otherwise, we make a call to the granted function. Now, if we look down below, we've got our granted function that just outputs access granted. Of course, normally in an application, privileged stuff might happen here that would be very interesting to the attacker. So let's build a copy of this. We're going to use the no stack protector argument. This just disables a couple of exploit mitigations, in particular uh, the use of canaries or canaries to, to check that we're not overflowing the buffer and attempting to overwrite things like the return pointer. We're also using dash m32 to make sure that we compile a 32-bit executable. Uh, this would work with a 64-bit executable, but it just makes the memory addresses a little more painful to use. So let's just run our application to validate that it works as expected. We'll put in an incorrect password and the correct password that we know by virtue of a bit of source code access. Let's see if we can do something a little more interesting with this. We're going to generate with Python a set of 100 of the letter A in capitals and place it into attack.txt. So if we have a look at attack.txt now, it's just 100 A's. So let's run a.out and feed in attack.txt. Immediately we get a segmentation fault. The program has crashed for some reason, which is interesting. In order to take this further, we need to do a bit of reverse engineering of this application, and we need a debugger to understand exactly what's happening. So we're going to fire up a copy of GDB, nice and readily available, and one of the best tools for this job. Now, first things first, we're just going to rerun a.out and feed in attack.txt. Everything crashes, segmentation fault again, but note, when the program crashes, we get this value of 0x41414141, 41, 41, 41, which is interesting because 41 is the hexadecimal equivalent of the ASCII capital A. Okay, let's do a little more analysis here. We can do an info func to list out all of the different functions uh, that exist in this particular uh, binary. Notice we've got some of the functions we saw in the source code like gets and printf, stracomp, some of them being listed at PLT, or the Procedure Linkage Table. And that's something that we get into in a lot more depth in the likes of the SANS 660 Advanced Penetration Testing and Exploit Writing course. But for now, we don't need to know too much about it. We're going to focus on main here, which was the entry point to our application. So let's disassemble main. And here we can see the basic code uh, that is being executed. Now, don't worry if you haven't read too much assembly before. It's actually reasonably easy to follow. We've got a call to printf up here. 
uh, we're outputting something to the screen, and we've got our call to gets, which is where our user input is being collected. Now that's what we're really interested in here. We want to be able to examine the state of the procedure call stack before and after we input data so that we can start to abuse it. In order to do this, we're going to set a breakpoint, which we do with break asterisk for memory address, followed by the memory address itself. I'm going to set one before and just afterward on this load effective address instruction. And that should let us see what's happened when we've input some information. So let's run the application again. And we're just going to provide uh, a set of inputs here of capital A's as they're nice and easy to recognize being that hexadecimal equivalent of ASCII capital A. So we ran the application, we hit breakpoint one. We're about to collect user input. We're going to examine the memory at the address pointed to by the ESP register. Registers are essentially very, very high speed memory of a small, very finite size, which is used by the CPU to perform the thousands and thousands and thousands of operations per second that allow our computers to work. Now, most of these are general purpose, but ESP is conventionally used to contain the memory address of the upper region of the stack, the top of the stack, which is where at present our function is going to be saving information. So let's just grab 20 hexadecimal values from the address contained in ESP. Don't panic at this point if you haven't been diving through the stack before. Uh, all will become clear. Now there's lots of information here, uh, possibly written by some previous operation. The stack is constantly growing up and collapsing down uh, as we enter and exit functions. We're going to skip over this and the program should ask us to enter some information. So I'm just going to put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letters of A. We hit breakpoint two. I'm going to collect again those 20 hexadecimal values at the same range from ESP. Note uh, our offset here from B0, we've got our 41s appearing. In fact, we've got four 41s here and four 41s here corresponding to the eight A's that I provided overwriting this. So that's where the information is being output. Now writing in A's is interesting and of course if we write in a large number of A's we'll end up overwriting information below this and causing the application to crash. That's exactly what happened when we first entered into GDB and ran our attack.txt. EIP, the extended instruction pointer, loaded a set of A's into itself and tried to go there and execute code, which caused the program to crash as there wasn't any legitimate code to be run at memory address 41, 41, 41, 41. So somewhere in this structure is something that enables us, when we overwrite it, to control where the computer goes to execute code. What we're talking about here is the return pointer. After the end of our buffer, somewhere down here, we've got various other bits on the stack, things like the saved frame pointer that is part of good stack mechanics, keeping everything moving and working properly. That's a lesson for another day. What we're really interested in is this guy here, the return pointer. What this is, is essentially a mechanism for the program to figure out how to return to the code it was executing before jumping into a subroutine or a function. When the program enters a function, it jumps off to a branch of code somewhere else, and it needs to store this return address on the stack so that it knows how to get back later. This return address normally points to legitimate program code. In our case, it goes on to do the other things in our code. However, if we could overflow where we're writing these 41s and modify this, we would be able to hijack execution and have the system execute some code at the supplied address. Or potentially, even supply code of our own in some kind of data structure, and then modify this memory address to point back to our supplied address, enabling us to run anything that we want to. I spotted this so quickly just from eyeballing it based on memory ranges and a bit of knowledge of the application. Normally, we'd have to use reverse engineering, we'd have to count, we'd have to do some fuzzing, putting in lots and lots of malformed test cases, maybe trying A, 
AA, AAA, until eventually we cause it to crash in a way that we understand. But again, that's a lesson for another day. What you can see here is that essentially there are 28 A's until we hit our range of the return pointer. So we're actually overwriting it fully with 32 A's. So let's put GDB in the background and we're going to use Python once more to generate our test case. So we're going to print out uh, 28 of, helps you use quotes correctly, 28 of the letter A and then we're going to put in four letter B's which as you might have guessed it is 42, 42, 42, 42. Okay, let's try that with our quotes. Really don't like those single quotes today. Have a look at attack.txt and there are our B's. Let's go back to GDB and we're going to rerun our attack from before with this new file. Remember the breakpoints will still be set so that we can analyze what's happened. Okay, run attack.txt start from the beginning. We hit our breakpoint 1 and I'm just going to grab those values from ESP again. We'll hit continue and we hit our second breakpoint. Now notice here we've overwritten with A's all the way through the stack and we've overwritten the 16 that we initially allocated. Do note that depending on the compiler it may not be exactly 16 as the space provided in the stack. It could be larger than that. So you do have to do a bit of counting and changing depending on the situation. So here we've got our 42s uh, which in theory overwrites the return pointer. So when we continue execution we get 42, 42, 42 and if we do info reg you can see that EIP has been loaded with 42s where other registers have been trampled with 41s. So we have specific EIP control. But who cares? I mean, we can crash the program with 42s. That's just annoying. Now we're going to make this useful. Let's go back to our main function. Note here at the bottom, we have our call to the granted function. And that's stored at memory address 0x08048 for FA. If we do 28 A's followed by our memory address, we should be able to cause the program when it returns to go and run the granted function for us. So let's drop uh, GDB into the background again and we'll bring up our Python example from before, but we're going to change our B's and we're going to put in that memory address of granted. Now we have to put this in in little endian. Uh, don't get me started on endianness generally and why that's even a thing. You can go and rant on Wikipedia and find numerous other irritating forums if you'd like to, but it's little endian. So backslash x fa backslash x84 backslash x04 backslash x08. So you'll recognize the 080484fa just provided backwards with this backslash x for hex notation. And again, I've managed to miss my single quote. Okay, let's have a look at attack.txt. Looks nice and odd. Excellent. Let's bring up GDB once more. And we're going to rerun our attack and eyeball whether we've overwritten the return pointer correctly. So let's run this again. It'll automatically run it with the previous argument. So attack.txt is still included, which is our new version here. We'll grab our 20 accessible values from ESP, continue, hit the second breakpoint, and here you can see we've got all of our A's followed by the memory address of the granted function. And just to validate that that is actually a memory address we can use, I'm going to grab a single instruction with x slash i at this memory address. And you can see we've got our call to granted there, or we're inside the granted function. Which means when we continue execution, the program still crashes. I mean, we've corrupted the stack by overwriting things, but the access granted function does indeed work. So we've successfully exploited this flaw. We've done a buffer overflow to modify the return pointer and pointed it to some code that the attacker shouldn't have had access to. Always do that. 
Let's quit, and just to prove that this works now, we're going to run a.out with attack.txt outside the debugger, and note we get the output of access granted. So this is now a nice little file that we can use to exploit this particular application. Now this is a very simple example. We don't have any exploit mitigations in our way. We wrote the source code so we understand the size of the buffers, but hopefully that gives you a little more insight into exactly what's being modified and what power we have uh, when we're able to overwrite the boundaries of a buffer like our password buffer here. Again, it, it really illustrates the importance of doing bounds and data type checking as a developer. Granted on more modern operating systems, exploit mitigations, things like the canaries or cookies on Windows systems, will make this much harder. But under the right conditions, those have been bypassed many times as well. So critical developers pay attention to this stuff.